You're listening to Now I've Heard Everything, conversations with the icons of our time. John, on the one hand, felt this great sense of obligation to be out there to continue the work of the Kennedy family, but he was raised by someone who, by all accounts, had profound ambivalence about John being a part of the Kennedy family. Former George Magazine editor Richard Bradley, today on Now I've Heard Everything, I'm Bill Thompson. It was 25 years ago tomorrow, July 16, 1999, that a small plane crashed off the coast of Martha's Vineyard, taking the lives of John F. Kennedy Jr., his wife Carolyn, and his sister-in-law Lauren Bassett. At the time of his death, Kennedy was struggling to keep his magazine, George, afloat. Richard Bradley was one of the original editors at George, launching in 1995. By 1999, Bradley was executive editor of the magazine. In 2002, Bradley, who was writing under his birth name Richard Blow, published a book about JFK Jr. and George, a book called American Son. And the book was not without its critics and controversy. Some even questioned whether Bradley should have written the book at all. I met the author when he went on a book tour that spring. So here now, from 2002, Richard Bradley. This has been a very unusual publishing experience. Because, as you know, the publication of this book has been surrounded by hype and controversy. It's on the cover of People magazine. Um, and a lot of the reviews, I think, have been referencing that hype um, rather than what's between the covers. And while in some sense that's all good because it gets people talking about American mm -hmm. Sun, in another sense I hope that people can read the book and make up their own minds and try to come to the book with as much of a fresh, open mind as they can, uh, because uh, John deserved it. And this book may surprise people. It may not be what they expect at all. Why did you write this book? You know, <laughs> there apparently were a lot of people who, or, or some people anyway, who would rather right. you have not written this. There were some people who would rather I didn't write this book. There were some people... Uh, people who knew John socially and some of my ex-colleagues at George Magazine who thought that those of us who knew John should never talk about that, um, that to do so would be in violation of the nature of our relationship with John Kennedy. Uh, obviously, I disagreed. Um, I worked with John in the context of a magazine for four years, so I felt like I had a pretty good sense of his attitudes towards the media and about people getting written about. Um, I wrote this book because I felt that for four years I had been a witness to what I thought was a fascinating moment in American cultural history, and that was the son of an iconic president uh, who becomes so frustrated with the state of political journalism that he decides to start his own magazine to do something about it. Uh, and thus was born George Magazine, uh, which was kind of a radical experiment in political journalism, uh, marrying politics with celebrity, uh, but was at the same time a way for John F. Kennedy Jr. to investigate some questions about the nature of his own existence, his own identity, um, while uh, trying to figure out what he was going to do next. It's, it, it's kind of a, a paradox that he is inevitably in the spotlight. Yes. But on the other hand, he's just trying to do a decent job and be a <laughs> decent American. You know, he took that job of being a journalist very seriously. I mean, he uh, was very proud of the magazine. John used to go into newsstands and check and see how many copies in the magazine had been sold. Uh, and he used to do the same thing. I used to do this as well, uh, which is go in and if you couldn't find the magazine, if the placement wasn't good enough, you'd surreptitiously move it to the front of the rack. <laughs> He wanted this magazine to try to have a positive impact, um, both on our readers to present a more optimistic view of politics, but also on other journalists to say uh, people in public life are not uh, perfect, uh, they're not saints, but in general they are out there making sacrifices trying to improve the common good. So why aren't you writing about them like that? Well, it's interesting. I find it ironic that some of your critics who say, 
oh, Harumph, he signed a confidence, he should not have written a book like this. Then in the next paragraph, they'll say, well, you know, he wasn't really very intimate with Kennedy, he just writes most of <laughs> They can't have it both ways. I mean, I mean, either they don't want you to write it, or they do want you to write it and dish the dirt. Well, you can't please everybody, and what I tried to do is write an honest account that reflected what was, to me, the most important aspects of John's life. But at the same time, if you want people to read a book, if you want people to get that good stuff out of it, you have to tell the story of the human being. I mean, people are interested in personalities. Um, John had a fascinating personality. Uh, he was uh, not just a terrific guy to be a around, warm and funny and thoughtful, but also someone who was really struggling to figure out what I thought was a basic conflict for him, which was that he was the son of a father who was a public figure and obviously wanted to be a public figure. Uh, but was raised by a mother who, after she left the White House, wanted to have nothing to do with being a public figure. John, on the one hand, felt this great sense of obligation to be out there to continue the work of the Kennedy family. But he was raised by someone who, by all accounts, had profound ambivalence about John being a part of the Kennedy family. This is pretty deep stuff. Th these are not easy questions for anyone to answer. I'm told that around the halls of, of Doubleday, when Jackie worked there, right. that after a while, these people said, you forgot that she was a former first lady, mm -hmm. that she was just Jackie, a book editor who was a really nice person to be around. Is the same thing here? Tr Do you forget after a while that he's this, this, as you said a moment ago, this iconic, this son of a president, and he's just, John is a really nice guy to be around? Actually, I, I'd have to disagree with that. No, because the thing about John was that it was when you first met him that he seemed like he might be just a nice, normal, regular guy. But in fact, the more you knew him, the more interesting he became. Because the more you realized that this was a figure who was such so central in American life because of what he represented to millions of Americans. I walked down the street so many times with John where people would call out to him, introduce themselves to him, and they felt like they had some kind of relationship with him. And they did, in fact, because he represented to them the hope and optimism and idealism that his father had represented. And people believed that John could carry on that work. Uh, they also felt like they had seen this man grow up, uh, and they knew him in that way. So John, of course, didn't know them from Adam, but at the same time, there was the sense that John was, and this is why I named the book this, The American Son. Um, and I also deliberately uh, wanted to, to kind of use that play on words, son, a child, but son also being uh, the great ball in the sky, because he was, in fact, someone who lit up a lot of people's lives. As evidenced by the letters that came in after his death. We received at George Magazine thousands of letters from people who wrote to us basically to say, I never met John Kennedy, but I felt like I knew him. Uh, one person wrote, I am so sad, but I really can't say why. And I was very affected by all those letters. I couldn't respond to them because there were so many. Uh, but it's one of the reasons why I wrote this book, because I wanted to respond to those letters. I wanted to say to those people who felt like they knew him, Yes, you're right about what you knew, but in fact, there was so much more there. Uh, there was a man who was searching and who was finding himself. You know, again, coming back to, you weren't exactly, you know, you weren't all like you know, drinking buddies and tennis buddies, and you weren't intimately involved in every aspect of the family. You were seeing him from a professional point of view. You're seeing him in the office. You're seeing right. him, you know, over a four year period, which is not as short a period as some people, you know, <laughs> the critics say he only knew him for four years. Well, you thought four years is a long time. And also remember, uh, a startup magazine is a very intense place under oh, yes. the best of circumstances. You're working very intimately together for long hours. Um, fighting together, hashing things out, uh, bonding over uh, the process of starting something very experimental, uh, creating something together. And you had at George that situation compounded by the fact that we were all uh, working with this person who was so fascinating, but also so decent. Um, everybody at George felt a very strong kinship with John. Um, 
in a way that I think has been hard to explain to people who did not work there. One of uh, the most commonly asked questions I would get when people found out that I'd worked at George was, oh, did you know Jeff K. Jr.? And I'd sort of laugh and say, well, actually, he comes to work pretty much every day. His office is right next door to mine. But at the same time, it bothered me a little because I knew how seriously John took this work, and it frustrated me that people assumed that he was kind of a dilettante about it, that he was sort of like an absentee editor who would show up every once in a while just to make sure that we were all typing away. I thought John deserved more credit than that. Well, you give him the credit of this book. I mean, he comes across as a very decent person. Decent, serious, someone who made everything look easy even when it wasn't. And it wasn't always easy for him. I think there were times when he must have thought, I really do not want to be this person that you all think I am. One of the... uh, uh, most interesting times working at George uh, that I talk about in American Sun was when he wrote that editor's letter about his cousins in which he referred to them as having become poster boys for bad behavior. And to go along with the editor's letter, he ran a photograph of himself in which he appeared to be naked and he was looking upwards at a dangling apple. (laughs) Now, John took a lot of criticism for that. I mean, people went crazy. Uh, Dissing cousins... Uh, one Kennedy rips into another. And the fact was that that was so widely misinterpreted. What he was actually saying was, my cousins have made mistakes, but the amount of attention that's being paid to those mistakes is enormous, vastly disproportionate to the things that they did wrong. And we really need to think about how we want to treat those people in public life, because if this is the way we treat them, no one will go into public life anymore, perhaps including myself, John Kennedy. And you want me to go into public life. So I'm going to pose in a way that uh, almost nude and, and suggest to you, the emperor has no clothes either. This could happen to me. And what would you do then? Would you regret it? Would you regret that you had driven out of public life this person in whom you've invested so much hope and optimism. This is not an easy message to communicate, and it didn't always come across very well in that letter. But I think John was saying, in some way, I'm scared about going into an arena where people can be torn apart like this for things that may not be great, but aren't the worst either. Well, he had the rare opportunity to see from both sides, be to right. both, as you're saying, both to be the victim right. of journalism and to right. be its perpetrator. Right. Um, the Stephen Brill, the the magazine editor, mm-hmm. uh, used to say that the best training for any potential journalist is to be written about, <laughs> and by that standard, no one had more journalism training than John F. Kennedy Jr. <laughs> That's true. You, he, you think he would have made a good father? Oh, I think he would have made a wonderful father. Um, I think he would have made a great father. John was once talking to me about his cousin Joe uh, during the time that Joe was going through his own little scandal. And John wondered aloud if Joe would resign from politics. And he turned to me and said, you know, whatever else he's done in his life, Joe's a great father. He is a great father to his kids. And no matter what you do in politics, if you are a great father... And that's the most important thing. And it was a very powerful moment because John never really had a father. Or he had a father who was uh, an icon uh, and in some ways quite a burden, quite a challenge to live up to, but not a father who could throw a ball around with him or take him to a football game or that kind of thing. But I saw John with around children And he was incredibly good with them, Uh, I think in part because they didn't know who he was. It didn't matter a whit to them that he was John F. Kennedy Jr. And uh, he loved kids, and kids loved him. I think he would have made a a wonderful father. Can you imagine him having a big desk and having his son playing under the desk while he's sitting there doing, you know, editor editor kind of thingies? Uh, What a picture that would have been. 
I think that uh, it would have given John so much happiness <laughs> um, to have had a, a child and and to be able to be uh, the father that he never had. Well, there is something kind of poignant about a story like this because as happy as it is and as 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 wonderful a portrait as you painted, I mean, we know how the story has to end. It ends. It ends in tragedy. It does end in tragedy, uh, and there's no escaping that. What I tried to to do in American Son is to say that although the person is not here anymore, the things that he stood for, um, the values that were important to him, the work he tried to do in his life, these are things that other people can can still do. Um, it's important to talk about what John Kennedy stood for. That's one of the reasons I felt it was so important to do this book. And, you know, I think that that history is a very fragile thing. Uh, and I did not take it for granted that these things would be remembered about John F. Kennedy Jr. Um, people are forgetting George Magazine. The things that, uh, because of the way that the media works, the things people remember about John might be that he once went out on a date with Madonna, uh, or that he failed the bar exam <laughs> twice. But these were not what was important about John Kennedy. What was important about John Kennedy was that he had an enormous responsibility in being the son of perhaps the most beloved president in our nation's history, whose life was cut tragically short, and all of those hopes and expectations descended to John, and he did his best to live up to them. And that was an enormous gift to this country, and I think that gift survives him. Richard Bradley is 60 now. George Magazine folded in 2001. Now you can get your copy of American Son by Richard Bradley by tapping the link in our show notes, or by going to our website, heardeverything.com. We may earn an Amazon commission if you make a purchase. HeardEverything.com is where you can also hear my 2012 interview with the former personal assistant to JFK Jr. at George Magazine, Rosemarie Terenzio. Before I was even 30 years old, I was controlling access to arguably the most famous man in the world. But to me, he wasn't a celebrity. And my 2011 conversation with Caroline Kennedy. That's one of the things about poems that is so special. They're short, they're intense, they travel easily. People tend to think of poetry as being like an old-fashioned, little obscure, weird pastime. And of course, we post new episodes of Now I've Heard Everything every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And you can find us everywhere you listen to podcasts. And thank you so much for listening. Next time on Now I've Heard Everything, she earned a reputation as a tough and fearless crime reporter in Miami. And then turned her talents to writing fiction and great mystery novels. My 1992 conversation with Edna Buchanan. I really love fiction. I'm really blessed because it's what I wanted to do when I was four years old. I told people I would be a writer when I grew up, and I intended it for it to be fiction. You know, journalism was an accident that I sort of happily fell into. That's next time on Now I've Heard Everything. I'm Bill Thompson.